right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. Uh, today we have Mahmoud uh, Razmi with us. Uh, Mahmoud is a, a self-described failed academic who is taking philosophy back to the marketplace. Um, and today's session is uh, called Marketplace Philosophy. And uh, uh, Mahmoud has a wonderful uh, Substack, uh, a Decaf Quest, and he teaches a lot of uh, courses on philosophy. He was actually uh, someone, uh, Sarah, who's here, uh, uh, someone from the Stoa, put uh, Mahmoud on my radar. I quite liked his vibe and what he's doing. So I invited him to the, the Stoa uh, to present and share his journey from being a philosopher in an academic context to taking philosophy uh, to the marketplace. Because that is a theme of uh, a lot of people who are doing really good para-academic philosophical work or just philosophy in the wild essentially is trying to figure out this uh, um, this code. So um, I'm going to tag in Mahmoud in a moment. He's going to uh, share his screen and present uh, and then we'll uh, pivot to a QA. and a If you have any questions anytime put it in the chat. I'll call on you during the Q&A portion. You can ask your question Mahmoud and uh, if you don't want to be on YouTube just indicate that and I'll read your question on your behalf. Um, so that being said, welcome to the store my friend. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and hello everyone. Thank you for joining and thank you Sarah for uh, the shout out somehow. This is, this is interesting and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and again, thank you for signing up for the courses. I mean, yeah, I still can't fathom uh, the fact that people pay money to sign up for online philosophy courses. So I'm every day, it's like, it, it, it doesn't cease to surprise me that people do that. So I'm gonna be talking about this uh, today, but again, thank you very much for joining and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, how many minutes is it usually 25, 30? Yeah, that presentation, I'll make yep. it. Yeah, and then if you have, by the way, if you have any questions or uh, if you have any objections on anything I'm going to be saying today, uh, because it can be quite controversial, uh, please do, do let me know. Uh, and uh, let me share philosophy. Okay. Uh, can you see? Is it all good? Okay. And the chat is here. If you have anything to say, also uh, do let me know or write it down in the chat, and then Peter will uh, will read it out loud. Again, thank you very much, Peter, for the invitation. Uh, and as you see from the title here, uh, philosophy in the marketplace from a philosophy academic. <laughs> yeah, the a the philosophy the philosophy entertainer living under a bridge and this is kind of somehow by chance by accident by mistake call it whatever i created this brand of myself living under a bridge because i mean i was and still am sort of a starving philosophy teacher so this is what i'm going to be talking about today and as per usual i'm going to be starting off with a whoops with two jokes, well, two jokes, just to give you a sense of who I am, what I do. I'll, I'll tell you a bit about my background shortly as well and how I ended up somehow teaching philosophy online uh, for a living because currently this is what I do. So for example, if next month no one signs up for my courses, I will literally be living under a bridge. Uh, the reason why I started taking philosophy to the marketplace is that I wanted to bridge the gap between academia and industry, and I'm now staying under that bridge. And also, when I was a child, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian, but then I studied philosophy, so I became the joke. And this is pretty much sums it up. That's, that's what I do. I, I'm, I teach philosophy, and soon I'm going to be living under a bridge. <laughs> exactly, Diogenes energy. Like uh, I, I forgot who posted this tweet yesterday. Uh, uh, Mark Manson, I think he was like, uh, "If you want to be someone, or I, you have if whatever you're reading, this is what you're gonna be, or what you're aspiring to." And then I commented, 
explains why I ended up on their bridge. So my venture to bring philosophy back to the marketplace started uh, two years ago, uh, or almost three, 2020, well, 2019, 2020. And for several reasons, uh, I decided to do this. Uh, it wasn't something I had planned for. Uh, I knew that I was disillusioned with philosophy. Uh, I knew that I wanted something else, uh, but nothing was coming up. I really didn't have any opportunities. I'm also going to be explaining this in the other slide. Uh, but the reason why I started uh, bringing philosophy somehow back to the marketplace is first off, as an academic, I sucked. As simple as that. It's like, I really sucked as an academic in the sense that, yeah, I had a PhD in philosophy, but when I entered academia, naive me finally realized that they don't really care about teaching. They cared more about publishing, etc. And I come from Lebanon. So uh, in Lebanon, we don't have as many opportunities for lectureships. Uh, because many people would tell me, yeah, have you tried looking for community colleges in the US and stuff like that? Yeah, I did. I couldn't find any job because the market is really saturated. So I was in quite the predicament because I thought, so I finished my PhD in 2015, but I had been teaching for uh, uh, since 2013 uh, as a part-timer at two universities, Lebanese American University and American University of Beirut. And finding a full-time job for those of you who are in academia, particularly philosophy, you would know better than I do that the market is very saturated, uh, the opportunities are very limited, and not to mention nowadays, you know, uh, with COVID and whatnot. So it's it's really difficult to make your way into academia to, to find a position. It might be easier for those who want to publish. It might be easier for those who actually enjoy doing philosophy research, whatever that means, because I genuinely don't understand that. I don't understand what philosophy research means. And this is why I was like, the hell with it. I enjoy teaching uh, and pretty much that's it. I enjoy reading philosophy as well. And I enjoy communicating these ideas, but then all the other aspects of academia, uh, I did not enjoy. So why, how did I end up quitting my job? Because I quit in, as I said, in 2020. Uh, well, it wasn't because of some sort of heroic move. Uh, it was simply because there was an economic crisis in Lebanon. Uh, protests happened in October, 2019 and uh, one, disaster after the other, we ended up with an economic crisis, everything blew up. And my salary was now worth only a few hundred dollars. So I would make normally because I was a part timer to give you an idea between somewhere between uh, $3,000. So it wasn't that bad, right? That was just precarious. Up to one semester, I made uh, $6,000 a month. But then all that uh, devalued because of the economic crisis and the Lebanese pound, which was which is the currency we we are paid in, the currency of Lebanon, uh, was worth five hundred dollars, and so I I wouldn't have been able to make ends meet, so I was kind of in a very precarious situation because of the economic crisis. They were going to be downsizing as well. Many people eventually lost their their jobs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and. I really had to find something else. I was stuck. So I took the plunge, but I didn't know what to do, right? Like what, what does a philosophy academic, what can a philosophy academic do? Uh, you might say, yeah, you can, you can transition into industry. Yeah, sure. I can like, it, it is a possibility, but then I was in academia for too long. I kind of felt I, I comfortable somehow. Uh, and I think this is something that maybe academia and any other job uh, does to oneself. Like if you, if you only focus on one thing for too long, 
uh, you might end up becoming rusty, like myself. Uh, I was at academia for seven years, yeah, but then I didn't work on many other skills. Why also? Because I was constantly looking for a job, right? I was constantly ensuring that I have classes, that, that I'm given courses, I'm grading papers, I'm doing this and that. And then by the time I have, uh, I, I could relax, I was burnt out and I really couldn't focus on anything else. But then uh, on Twitter, I, I started Twitter in 2018. Uh, bit by bit, I started coming across people like, you know, uh, Daniel Vasalo here and uh, other people like Guru Anaerobic, Mark Baker, etc., who were talking about something else, about, you know, venturing into the digital world, creating something online, doing something, whatever it is, tinkering around, building a portfolio of small bets, like you don't have to focus on one career, you have to diversify, you have to look for other things, et cetera, et cetera. So it gave me this idea, I wanted to do something. I didn't really know what I wanted to do because as I said, uh, really as an academic, I had no skills. I had to learn a lot of things. And these things I will be learning eventually when I start this thing online. So one day in May, I posted this tweet. I had already put my notice, right? I told uh, the chairpersons or the chairperson of the department at the two universities, I'm leaving end of this semester. And he was like, yeah, but uh, did you have a job? No. Uh, do you know what you're doing? No. Do you have any other plan? No. I just wanted to, you know, make myself feel uncomfortable, get cornered myself somehow in order to figure something out. And this is where this tweet comes in. I just posted, you know, fellow tweets, anyone potentially interested in a nine weeks, 2.5 hours weekly online course on existentialism. And this is, this is the syllabus, you know, Schopenhauer, uh, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, existentialism is humanism, Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Heidegger, etc. If you know philosophy as well, like if, if you're familiar with philosophy, you would look at this syllabus and, and think to yourself, this is quite ambitious. It's like I, I want to cover the entire of the entirety of existentialism in a in a nine weeks, 2.5 hours weekly course. It was, I don't know what you think about this. But now for me, in, hi in hindsight, this, uh, this was very ambitious uh, and very academic as well. So I was still with this mentality, you know, I want to teach philosophy online. Uh, so I might as well just post a syllabus I would usually uh, uh, teach at university because, well, after all, this is how philosophy should be done. And this is how I have been doing it. This is how everybody does it. So you know, a very academic kind of course with academic lingo, etc. Luckily, though, this is why I said a lucky tweet. It somehow went semi-viral and it, 29,000 impressions, people somehow expressed interest with 4,000 engagements, 4,500. And they started writing to me uh, via DMs. They were like, yes, where can we sign up? And I had all like, it really, in hindsight, I really don't know how this happened. Like what, what was going on? Because I posted a tweet and usually I never had as many interactions. I, was, I would just trash talk academia on Twitter. I would publish a few articles here and there. I was very angry on Twitter, you know, keyboard warrior style. I got into fights and stuff like that. And, and all of a sudden I posted this tweet and for some reason people were interested. I genuinely did not think anyone would be interested. So it kind of caught me by surprise. And I was like, Shh, I have to figure something out because how am I gonna be paid? How are they gonna sign up? How are they blah, 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 you know? It's like all the, I didn't know absolutely anything. Um, I had a website there, uh, but it was my personal website where I posted academic stuff. Pretty much that was it. So I quickly had to, you know, figure something out, uh, set a payment gateway, try to get people to sign up, do it in, a, in an interesting way, 
have a landing page, blah, 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 blah. And eventually, uh, 44 people ended up signing up for this course. Again, like 44 people signing up for a course, many of whom did not know me. How, why? I genuinely don't know. Like, don't ask me why, because I, I don't know. Uh, many of them were following me on Twitter. And this is when I discovered the power of having somehow an audience, even if you trash talk and even if you do whatever it is, it's like there will be someone out there who will be like, you know what, I'll, I'll sign up with this guy. Like if they don't do it for the philosophy, at least they will have their reasons to do it, right? For, for whatever reason, uh, they're going to be doing that. But anyway, so for that, I will be forever grateful because it, it could have been a flop, right? It could have been a failure. And, and I will have, or I would have literally ended up under a bridge because I, I had some savings around, but then pretty much that was it for me. Uh, but it was, it was interesting, the experience, why? Uh, because again, I don't know what your backgrounds are. We can discuss this during the Q&A uh, and I'll get to know you more. Here I am for the first time in my entire life teaching. So I, I, I should, because 44 people signed up, I, I divided them into two sections. Uh, almost 20 people each. For the first time in my entire life, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the first time I, I did uh, online courses because COVID had happened, you know? So it was the first time in my entire life that I was teaching philosophy for people who came from diverse backgrounds, from all walks of life, adults, like adult, not, not students, I mean, uh, the majority of whom had uh, or have experience, work experience, right? They've worked in the industry. And I was there trying to explain to them Descartes, uh, I think, therefore I am. Rationalism and empiricism, right? And this is, this is where the shock comes in. It was really a shock for me because I'm, I'm used to, you know, students, teenagers, 19, 18 to, to 22, uh, they, they do have some experience in life. They've taken courses, they've seen people, but then there's no depth to that experience. They have, they, they don't come from work experience, you know, you know, you know better. And bit by bit, I was being challenged somehow. It's like, I would not myself as, as, as my philosophical opinions. It's just someone would say Descartes is an idiot, but the difference between someone saying Descartes is an idiot in the marketplace and someone saying Descartes is an idiot in an academic setting is because you're supposed to give arguments in a very particular way as at university because ultimately they need to sit for an exam, et cetera, et cetera. But here, this guy who would say Descartes is, a, is an idiot might as well think this is useless, it's pointless, I'm not going to join anymore. And so the stakes are different here. This person voluntarily paid to learn a thing or two. And if they say Descartes is an idiot or Hume is an idiot or whoever it is is an idiot or we don't understand or this is too abstruse, this is too academic, well, I had to adapt. And it was genuinely a shock for me because I started learning other things. I, I needed to, to come up with, like I've, I, I had read, you know, introduction to philosophy, uh, introduction to philosophy books, uh, the, the more advanced, like Bertrand Russell's, uh, all the way to the more, the simpler. Uh, I think there's, there's this uh, yellow book, I forgot what it's called. It's like the, a very simple, nice introduction to philosophy, but everything they do is somehow focused on the academic bit. And I don't know how to explain, right? It's just, it all boils down to explaining Descartes in a certain way, uh, in a certain manner. You just use different examples to make things easier to understand and that is it. And so with time I had to adapt uh, and I started realizing more about myself, uh, meaning that what, what was I really doing? 
right? Why? Because if I wanted to make this as, as a business of some sort, in a sophist manner, being paid to do philosophy, I had to adapt. I had to adapt to the marketplace. I had to adapt, to, I had to get other people to sign up for my courses. And so this is, this is where I started tinkering a bit uh, and adapting to people's interests, how they viewed philosophy, why I, I started trying to, well, during the, the courses, I would ask them why, why they were here. And based on the discussions that we were having, I would kind of have an insight as to why they were there, what they were expecting, et cetera. And this is where I started learning other things. I needed to kind of make the content interesting, related to other people, really get, get it uh, to, or make it more meaningful to whoever is going to sign up, which was something I did at university, but it was conditioned by the setting. Uh, so some of the skills or some of the whatever books, new books I, I read and videos and stuff like that was really I got into marketing and advertising and copywriting and storytelling. And I started taking courses and signing up for courses, etc., in order to be able to know how I can translate philosophy in a way that would be more interesting to people. To not students, this is where the different educational model but uh, just random people who are paying for this. What's the difference? Like, so I started asking, asking myself, why would they sign up for a synchronous course, pay $150 for it, when the material is already available for free online? So where is the added value somehow? And this is where I started learning about myself more. Uh, I realized that, yeah, I do like philosophy. I do enjoy philosophy. It was what I had been doing for so long. But I do a different kind of philosophy. It's like, I don't even know if it's a different time. Maybe other people out there are doing it. But then I became more at ease with what I did because I had an imposter syndrome when I was at, at, academia, uh, at university and academia because I really didn't fit there. It's not my thing. I'm not saying that academia is, is bad or... I have my criticisms of academia and university and the educational model in general, but then some people in like, it, it works for some people, not for me. Uh, and what works for me and what adds value in my courses, I've realized is just the following. Uh, because it's synchronous, there's interaction and people were looking for a space where they could discuss things and they could discuss things in a non-academic setting, but also in a philosophical kind of setting, whereby I would ask questions, uh, they would get introduced to new ways of, of looking at things, different points of view, and anything can be questioned in this virtual space, in my case. So I'm not there to peddle ideas, ideologies. I'm not there to do politics. I'm not there to do anything. I'm just there to do the old Socratic tradition uh, or to, to, to keep it alive somehow by just asking people questions, explain a few ideas, the history of philosophy somehow, and make it interesting uh, in a way that would get people on the one hand engaged and on the other hand, they would learn a few things and also they would think. And it, it's very interesting because with time, I've learned a lot myself and then you see people who, who uh, stick with me. They, I have a lot of uh, repeaters. They, they sign up for, I have even yearly packages. People sign up for those. Don't ask me why or how they keep coming because it's, it's not because they, they only they want to learn what Descartes said because at one point they can start treating Descartes by themselves. But it's this, the space, the interaction, the dialogue, the discussion, the stories, the gossip, because I focus a lot on those as well. Uh, people just like the gossip. And when you, when, when you present philosophy in a way that would contextualize it, and we, I, I almost gossip more than I explain concepts, they enjoy it. Uh, so this is, this is where I started realizing that I really am not a philosophy teacher. 
I would want to be a philosophy entertainer. I'm not a I'm not fit for 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 stand up comedy material. Otherwise, uh, I would I would have done that. But uh, yeah, one example, and uh, I have this example, and and this will be it for for my presentation. I started to like I I've been toying around with with these things, right? Why do I care about whether or not something is fiction or is real or is or happened or is factual or is rigorous? In so far as you know stories or gossip like i'm not doing i'm not saving lives i'm not doing medicine i'm not i'm, I'm just getting people to, to think right? and i'm not selling absolutely anything so i i do put this disclaimer like i i do mention that that don't take my words for it so so this is one example of the stories i i would uh somehow uh come up with when seneca got his stoic philosophy so this was a a uh, a bar I saw in, uh, or a pub or a cafeteria in, uh, in Cordoba. Uh, so I thought to myself, well, how can I post this on Twitter and make it a bit engaging? Because I also posted it in my newsletter. When Seneca got his Stoic philosophy degree, he couldn't find a job for several years. So he, so he opened a coffee shop, but he only served decaf, so he went bankrupt. After Seneca's coffee shop went bankrupt, he moved from Cordoba to Salamanca, where I am based, to work as a bartender at Cafe Nero. But then he broke the espresso machine, so the owner, Nero, asked him to commit digital suicide, so he deleted his Twitter account and went back to using MySpace. For those of you, well, of course, I explain, like, there is a background kind of to this story, right, because uh, Seneca was Nero's advisor and Nero, when, when he suspected that uh, Seneca was involved in a conspiracy to kill him, he asked him to commit suicide, which he did. So this is kind of a play on, you know, the backstory and then pictures I wanted to post on, on Twitter without this inspirational caption. So I kind of come up with content that people engage with. And for some reason, well, they, they liked it, it um, and it was popular. Uh, this tweet. So, so I turned it into an Insta, uh, 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 a Substack post, and also it was it was interesting. And I did uh, like the kind of content now I post on Twitter includes also stuff like that, like a philosophical stroll in Cordoba because I was there for a for a ironically philosophy conference, but not an academic conference because they are looking also for the to kind of bring philosophy back to the marketplace. And yeah. So what my, my key takeaways from all this is really uh, philosophy doesn't sell and doesn't sell in all sorts of uh, aspects. Like I'm not only talking about philosophy as a business, even philosophy as, as a field, like many people are interested in it, yeah. But then there's something about it that, that is just inaccessible somehow. And this is why I am exploring other ways of making it interesting. Like for example, and I'll, I'll end with this, um, for like the analytic philosophy course that we're teaching now, I, I decided to start co-teaching with, uh, with people. So I have uh, a friend of mine uh, who was my colleague at university, uh, he's a physics, uh, graduate and a philosophy graduate and so he takes care of the rigorous part of everything I talk about uh, and I just trash talk now this is this is kind of my my job I I do that so analytic philosophy I called it analytic philosophy not many people signed up I thought analytic philosophy would sell because everyone is interested 10 people signed up only and then I thought to myself well let me try something new and so I, the course I'm teaching in March, I called it Exploring Uncertainty. And I changed the copy a bit. There is no philosophy there, right? I did not mention philosophy at all. Uh, and people know, like the same people who follow me on Twitter know that I teach philosophy, right? But then the course itself is called differently. The copy is different, et cetera, et cetera. Up until now, I think 22 people have signed up. So there you go, the, the difference. Uh, 
So for me, it's, it's, it's a learning experience. Uh, there's, I don't know, it's just um, an exploration kind of uh, journey for me in terms of how I can make philosophy more accessible to people. And this is really what I'm also doing now. This is why I came to, to Salamanca. We can discuss this afterwards because I was based in Beirut. And this is what I do at Puentica. That's, that's now my, my, my branding. Uh, the Philosophy Club for Bridge Dwellers. You'll spend, if you sign up for one of my courses, uh, you'll spend a lifetime asking questions for which you might never find answers. And thanks. Awesome. Well done, uh, Mahmoud. Um, and I always appreciate a, a good stoic joke uh, here at the store. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to put in the chat or raise your hand. We'll call on you in a moment. Um, and I'll share what came up for me. Like for one reason, there was this like scene that, that was common that always annoyed me when I was in um, university uh, for philosophy. And um, I never took like I was a bad student, but I never took notes. I never took notes in philosophy class. And then when I always saw someone like furiously taking notes, uh, it always pissed me off. Uh, and there's like a pretentious, a pretentious element to that, I imagine. But like when I reflect on it now, is most people were uh, taking philosophy, at least my peers, uh, in order to get good grades so they could prepare themselves for the market. <laughs> you know, so like they went to school, instrumentalized getting good at philosophy to either go to law school or whatever. Um, that always just annoyed me because as I was like, I, was, I really loved uh, philosophy. Um, but it seems like an interesting move. Uh, and that's, you know, the hidden curriculum there is that, you know, you just, uh, you're, you're, the whole thing is designed in order to be a good uh, um, person that can succeed in the market economy. Uh, but interesting move when you take philosophy to the marketplace. Um, I imagine the, the motivational schema of most people going it's more of an intrinsic motivation rather than an instrumental motivation of why they're taking uh, or learning philosophy. Um, and I have a follow-up question for that, but I'm just curious if you can kind of uh, um, tease out uh, the different types of motivations uh, and, and that spectrum for instrumental to intrinsic of people who sign up for your courses. Interesting. Um, see, I think there, it, like it's, I think it's both. It's motivate. It's it's both intrinsic. There's an intrinsic motivation because otherwise they wouldn't sign up. So they're really interested in uh, the material or the course or the subject matter, etc. And they're not doing it because uh, they want to succeed in life. They they or for any kind of reasons. So they're not they're not university uh, students. And I I agree with you. It's like yeah, what? Like this is okay. First off. For, for those who always defend academic philosophy, I get you. I do understand. You have to take notes because you want to understand Descartes, you, you want to teach, you want to do research, etc. This is fine. But yeah, that's, uh, the thing is, there's been this gap between what philosophy is for and what philosophy, how philosophy is, has, has become as, as just a another field, academic field that you just study at university and will only help you there. And for me, this divide is pointless. Like for philosophy is to, to help us think, to help us dialogue. Uh, and there might be many other reasons why people would sign up for a philosophy course. Some people are interested in stoicism because they want to, because first off it's, you know, it's, it's very appealing, it's very nice. And because they relate to it, because it's accessible, because it's interesting, because it's tackling you know, these big questions such that people, uh, or in a way that would help people deal with the uncertainty of the world. They're not taking philosophy because they want to become whatever. Many other people sign up for philosophy courses because they're looking for inspiration, because they're looking for uh, because it's, they want to just explore something new because they, they want to have a different vantage point uh, in, in how they approach things, their businesses, etc. So there are so many reasons, like based on, on what I, uh, like the, 
the participants, those who sign up for my courses, I've realized that each and every person has a story and is interested in philosophy because of many reasons. Some of them, as I said, are just interested in a pastime activity. They, they just enjoy. Others want to discuss with others. Uh, others want to explore new subjects and others want to apply it in their businesses. So it's, it's quite interesting, yeah. It's there, but none of them are studying philosophy because they, like in my case, because they, they want to sound, well, some of them maybe want to sound smart in, in their business dinners as well, but uh, that's besides the facts, like something that you can talk about with, you know, to impress others. But yeah, none of them is there because they're forced mm -hmm. and it makes all the difference. And the fact that they have experience, I, or, okay, I would also reflect on it from a different perspective. I think they come back to philosophy because after having this industry experience, they sometimes think there's something more that they should explore. And philosophy kind of fills this gap. I've realized also, but not the kind of, you know, we need to understand Descartes. No, I, I, we need to understand how Descartes can help us fill this gap. So I don't know if I made sense, try to come. Like, um, yeah, yeah, you know, that made yeah. sense. Um, reminds me like the original reason why I signed up for philosophy when I was in university, I was so confused. And like, basically my mother just pressured me to go to university and I didn't know what to do with life. They're like, oh, it's philosophy will handle this. <laughs> it's like, let to like, you know, I don't know if that was a blessing or a curse, but um, you know, never stopped asking questions since then. Uh, the uh, so my follow up question there is, like, I, I know a lot of people who are taking philosophy to the marketplace, um, like you know Justin Murphy with his indie thinkers, uh, Michael Millerman, uh, Cadell Lass here at the Stoa, and then you know Raven Connolly, and and they're like, uh, it'd be cool to you know have a taxonomy, motivational taxonomy to why people like take uh, philosophy in the marketplace, but there's a different kind of like vertical about like why they stay, you know, uh, once they take the philosophy course. Um, and, you know, partly it's like, you know, the charisma of the teacher like yourself, uh, but I think the other aspect is the community uh, and the whole kind of like the, the term, like the hot thing is a cohort based communities now where you just like teach uh, in a, a synchronous manner uh, with people in the same Zoom room and stuff. And it's almost like, it doesn't matter what it is you're teaching. It's just the fact that like, oh, this is, this is the real reason why we're here. Like finding like people that vibe with a similar thing that I do. Um, and it's almost like a new talent stack has to be emerged. Like, okay, I'm not here to like filter people into the market economy. I'm here to kind of like actually be a community organizer manager. Um, so I'm curious if anything comes up for you, for your experience with, with anything I just said. Uh, yeah, it's, it's precisely that. And that's also like, there are many others who are also taking philosophy back to the marketplace. I think you mentioned Millerman, right? Yeah, but, and I have a student, well, student, someone who took uh, my courses and actually signed up for the entire year and has been taking courses. Like I, I, he's, he's basically in every course and it's been the case since, since uh, summer. And he took a course with Millerman and this is, and I understand that. So for him, my courses are focused in a way, you know, it's, it's just an introductory somehow. We don't delve deeper into the texts. I, I, or I already explained what I do. And in the case of Millerman, he explained, well, it's, it's more, you know, structured, more focused. Uh, they delve deeper into the material, etc. That's fine. And he's doing it in a non-academic setting with people who actually want to do that. And this is maybe the nice thing about the market is that there's absolutely room for absolutely anyone to do. And if you find the right audience, then things will work. And this is where the vibing comes in. It's like people, I make sure to tell, to let people know what they're in for before they sign up. I, I, I once said in, a, in one of the classes, people think twice before they sign up for my courses. And they, they said, this is business-wise, this is bad. And I was like, no, because I want the, I want peop, I, the community, people who sign up to actually know what they're in for, which is this. Uh, like they, as I said, the, the philosophy entertainment somehow, call it whatever you want. And so, yeah, it creates a sense of community. And you see how people interact with each other and, 
and they start thinking about things and the way they change their the way they think about things, etc. It's it's been fascinating because I've I've been learning a lot also from that. So uh, so yeah, it's just it's a fascinating, interesting experience. Yeah, yeah, that's super cool. And just like there's so much room to experiment um, uh, in this this this. I'm just like Zeno. It's coming to mind. Like there probably would be no stoicism without Zeno. It's some just strange dude hanging out in the stove of Okali, just like you know, like you know, vibing. Uh, and then people were drawn to him, and then the philosophy emerged. Um, so let's pivot to a, a Q and A. Um, Young, you had a. We won't go in exact order, but uh, Young, you uh, had a question in the chat. Uh, hey, yeah, I really love the presentation, and I, I think I'm in a somewhere similar similar place. Um, I, I think I would also suck if I were to enter into academia. So I, I love that sort of uh, confessional sense. So I had two questions you can pick, or, or you can just kind of just jump off from it if you want as well. Uh, the question is sort of like I'm curious about how does the philosophy that you teach influence the philosophy that you practice. Um, on a, on a like a like a personal level or maybe even on an existential level, uh, and the second question, I'm also curious about like, since this is philosophy in the marketplace, do you think there's this could be a certain sort of audience capture? You know, as you spoke about how like they love the gossip and the the entertainment aspect of it. Like, have there been concerns about how it could sort of water down the the content, or has it been you know otherwise? Um, I'm just genuinely curious. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, interesting questions. I'll I'll answer the second part first, or the second question first, and then I'll I'll go to the to the first part quickly. But um, see, this is this is the thing. It's um, like I'm. It is watered down somehow because uh, sometimes we do dig deeper. Like we've uh, this is where Philippe comes in, uh, the co-teacher. Uh, we did give uh, philosophy of science, for example, and as a physics graduate, he took care of, you know, the the rigorous kind of stuff. And um, based on the tinkering, because of the like, I my my courses are structured in a way uh, or as such, four weeks, once per week, two hours per session. And so sometimes we, I would be ambitious like the syllabus I, I showed you. I wanted to explain Heidegger. I wanted to explain and then I realized I can't do that. And like it was a nine weeks course at first and then I realized people get bored with it. It's like it's a lot. And if, if they come from the business world and stuff like that, they have other engagements and so many things going on. So it's not it, it is watered down, but it's not because we were I was discussing this with Peter before we started. It's not I'm not compromising the material there so i am still explaining the cart but what what differs is the way i present the cart and it's it's just a starting point right and, that, and now we're giving analytic flow so it's also it also depends on the course like a an introduction course i would approach it in a way the existentialism existentialism course i approached it in a, in a different way but now there is a story there there is a narrative i i try to make sure that there's one concept that would stick with people and they automatically become more interested, start asking for more, and then look for other places or for, for other resources, et cetera. So it's, I think it's just to start the, um, yeah. Another thing I was thinking about, it's like what I do is I just hook them somehow. Because if, they're, if, if they show up to a philosophy course and it's tedious and boring and et cetera, they will just think philosophy is boring. But when they, you know, when they get introduced to it in a certain way, even if it's light, somehow they will start reading more on them by themselves, or or they will start, you know, looking for other sources and resources and stuff like that. So yeah, in my case, it's watered down. But then it's not that I'm I'm doing whatever. I'm still doing philosophy, but I frame it differently, and so they wouldn't even notice that I'm doing philosophy. Uh, and this is the tricky part. Uh, and mind you, some people did complain. Right? Like uh, throughout, uh, I've been doing this since May 2020, as I said. Uh, but I, I just tell them, you know, you want a refund? Like this is, I, it's written in the, 
description of the course. Like I'm not, this is what I do. Like, and there's a sample course there, right? There's a, there's a sample session on YouTube, etc. It's like, so I didn't really promise you something that I didn't deliver. Uh, luckily, no one complained that uh, because I, I tell them that I crack jokes jokes no one complained about my back my bad jokes thus far so i'm good in that sense they sign up for the jokes and then they stay there this is good as for the first uh question it's an ongoing learning process for me it's like the more i read the more i discuss the more i uh, explore philosophy philosophers etc it does have an influence on how i live my life Let's put it this way. So it's not that I'm, I'm uh, that's at, a, this is at a personal level. So I always make sure to, to keep a distance between the personal aspect of it versus what I want them to kind of learn. And then so far as they learn or they, they understand that philosophy can be practical, I'm good. But then they ask me, like, for example, in an existentialism course, what would Nietzsche say? And then I'm like, you're missing the point. So I, I don't know what Nietzsche would say about this. It's like, how would you do it? How would how will how how do you relate to this or that problem? So so yeah, and it's been affecting how I view the world, how I view, how I even approach my courses, how I teach, how I live, the decisions I make. So yeah, I mean. I, I can't tell you it's it's been going well for me because I'm living under a bridge now. So disclaimer, don't follow my steps. Any follow-up questions here, uh, Yang? No, I'm good. Uh, like, there are some good questions in the, in the comment section. So, Hope I answered your question, by the way. Yeah, no, totally. We'd love to chat more, but yeah. Thanks yeah, so I'm, uh, yeah I'm, I'm on Twitter, so. Cool. Sarah, thank you. Had a question. Hi, Mahmoud. <laughs> nice to see you. And nice again, you. thanks for the shout out. Yeah, great. Um, well, I think that maybe I should provide some testimonial while I'm here because I signed up initially for your class because one of your students got a discount if somebody else signed up. So that was a good marketing tool. And then I ended up signing for an asynchronous class with you just because I trust you. And so I think that's kind of important to, it's weird that I trust you because you tried to like put up this persona of not being trustable and like, yeah, so you like deliver the joke in order for us to, I don't know, like trust you as a curator. So that's kind of how I see you. And that's what my question basically is, is um, do you consider yourself a curator or a mentor or something else? because the word organizer has been thrown around here too. And I know that you market a lot. Um, so in other words, what role do you think you play in bridging the gap between philosophy and academia and in practice? Uh, yeah, first off, again, thank you. And trusting me is, is a huge thing, to be honest. I, I wouldn't suggest that anyone would do that. And honestly, it's not that I do this as for, because, you know, I want you to like it's I'm not saying this just to say this it's I think what I do is based on the past uh, two years is I ask questions and if I explain something I explain the material in a way that would be relatable but I never tell people how or what or why they should think this or that. And I think this is, this is in my case, what has been important. So when you see that, uh, for example, on, on Twitter, I would trash talk Marx, but then I'm teaching Marx, and then I'm teaching Marx in a way that you would think this is how it should be. I think this is, this is what people appreciate. Uh, because I don't only trash talk Marx, I trash talk myself, and I trash talk Heidegger, and I trash talk absolutely everyone. Because of what I learned, this sardonically speaking, I, I, I wrote a very short book because I was angry with academia and it's, it's actually for free. You can download it uh, for, on, on Gumroad. 
uh, it's like everyone is angry because of something this or that and and politics and everyone is taking extremes and everyone wants this or that and everyone wants to shut the other person up but blah 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 and i'm like <laughs> this is this is not how it should be it's like i understand there are certain things where we draw red lines but but if you're constantly antagonizing people with arguments i saw that also at your philosophy conferences etc everyone is like trying to prove themselves right and in my case i was like sardonically speaking socrates style is i'll i'm gonna be laid back ask questions and get people to think i don't even care what they think like i'm not there to you know judge people but what i've noticed was that if you approach any topic and challenge people in a way that is just you know laid back without me telling them how they should think bit by bit an interesting discussion ensues and i think this is why people to use your word trust me uh, because i'm i'm really i don't have an agenda and and if if people ask me it's like why are you doing this well yeah i do love philosophy but then in a sophist manner i i have to live as well so it's not i'm not doing this just for the love of philosophy i'm doing this for a living as well so and i think this also helps like they know like i'm not selling you something i'm not selling you a project i'm not selling you grand things i'm just somehow someone who found a way to make a living online by asking questions and i do that without peddling like if you know if you want to know what i think i would tell you but then in a in a class i'm just asking questions so i think this is this is why people are interested maybe yeah as nathan said just ask questions and believe me it works it does work and they know less and less. This is what we do at Puentica. You, you learn less and less, and then you end up becoming bankrupt because you're paying for the courses, and you end up becoming a bridge dweller like myself. And I think Sarah is on her way to becoming, because it's interesting. You, you kind of you mentioned that you had quit your job, right? Uh, when you signed up for the course, and I was like, whoa, you're, you're, you're becoming a bridge dweller. So yeah. Any follow-up uh, share, Sarah? Yeah, it's that is interesting. Like you are a question asker, but you're able to have like a framework from which you ask questions. And so it's like guiding my mind to a deeper question. So that's the benefit to, to having you as basically like a mentor. So thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's kind of interesting too, like the the, as people know the show, I'm a big fan of being transparent with my motivations of what I'm doing here and, and whatnot. And it's almost like people get excited to support you uh, if they believe you. And then it's like, oh, shit, that I got to be likable. How do I be <laughs> likable? Oh, I'd probably just be authentic. <laughs> and so it's like it's like a virtuous cycle emerges. So maybe something about putting philosophy in the marketplace or in the gift economy or whatever um, has that effect on the person doing it. Uh, yeah, uh, let me just add this because you you mentioned or mentioned authentic and stuff like that. It's I for this is what I learned on Twitter. It's like uh, I what I toned down was being too antagonistic and picking fights. Uh, but that I did way before I I started teaching. Like I I, I started doing this. Uh, I and I wrote an article about this how I started using Twitter as as just a medium to know people and i think you're you're doing this and you're doing this on on youtube and you have other uh media to to do this on but yeah i noticed like at work i would try to you know be an academic etc but that wasn't me but then when i am myself on twitter so people trust you and like you and they're like yeah and I don't think it's they they like your idea. Like sometimes, of course, they would like your ideas, but then they just there's something about the honesty or transparency that makes you more trustable or whatever whatever word you want to call it. So this authenticity somehow. It's like this is what I think. And it's out there. And that's who I am. 
I'm not trying to sell you, well, I'm trying to sell philosophy courses, but I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you anything else. So yeah, I don't know, weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's cool, very cool. Um, oh, Carlos, yeah. you're there, hi. Do you have time to sneak in uh, one more Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. I'm, uh, let's say, uh, you might not have the time, I'm, I'm around. Cool, so maybe we'll have about one, one or two more questions. Uh, yeah. Vic, uh, you had a question in the chat. Vic, yes. Hey, Mahmoud. Yo. So, uh, so my question, the, the question that I wanted to ask is, uh, uh, do you think the global pandemic, the, the situation where, like, uh, it usually doesn't happen that the whole world is going through something that is very, very similar, because I can't think of another time. I mean, so that is a, a problem or a particular situation was this global. So it's something that people can all relate to. So do you think that sort of might be driving people to this sort of knowledge and thereby these sort of courses? And do you think it has maybe renewed respect for subjects like philosophy, which are usually seen as not so useful? So do you think the pandemic has anything to do with how people are viewing it and, and thereby like uh, people flocking to this sort of knowledge, which is usually seen as not commercially viable and, you know, this kind of, uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I think it, uh, I'm not so sure about uh, philosophy itself because maybe people were interested uh, about philosophy since, since ever, I don't know. Uh, but maybe what the pandemic helped with well obviously this is why i said the lucky tweet i posted the tweet in may uh we were on lockdown almost everywhere in the world people had no better thing to do except for you know be at home and this is why it helped so in that case yes what it helped with was yes a crisis of meaning exacerbated by the pandemic everyone was now uh, even though they were working from home, but they, they had more time to reflect on their lives and the decisions they've made. And I read many articles about how everyone is going to be quitting their job now, etc., etc. So it helped both ways and uh, renewing, yeah, as you said, renewing people's interest in, in philosophy, not, not necessarily in philosophy, like philosophy, this is what we were discussing, not, not as an academic thing, it's just as as a field that helps you tackle the big questions. And that's why I started with existentialism. I was like, what would sell existentialism in literature? And that's what people were interested in. So the Lebanese people who signed up uh, had, for example, lost their savings like myself. Uh, and in addition to the pandemic, in addition to absolutely everything, and they were asking themselves these questions, like, what's the point of it all? And then the non-Lebanese who signed up were like, we're doomed and there's nothing. And is there anything? And what's the point of life, et cetera? And uh, so the, the discussions were, were interesting. Yeah, so definitely. Um, I think if I had attempted to do that, and I think many people were doing that already before online, et cetera, I, I, just, I don't think it would have worked uh <laughs> yep world's oldest profession so philosophy is there i think to just help us tackle questions why is it important to do history of philosophy well so that we don't commit the same error that the analytic philosophers committed which is think that history is not important and start anew uh like also descartes but descartes knew his history uh, they didn't, many of them at least didn't, and you would repeat the same things that Kant and Descartes and Hume already had said. So it's, I think the history is just important to understand. In my case, I would say that there is like, it's already been discussed before. So what we just need to do is to, yeah, build better mental models somehow, relate to the world in a different way and see how they relate it to the world, et cetera, et cetera. Any follow-up share question, Vic? Uh, nothing, nothing. Thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you. Yeah, so definitely, had it not been for the pandemic, in my case, I don't like I was prepared, right? I, I already had Zoom. We all had Zoom. Uh, everyone had become accustomed to virtual 
meetings, even though everyone did it before, but somehow we now were prepared in addition to the lockdown and stuff like that. Yeah, better collective memory. And yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's end with uh, Kevin's question. Kevin, if you can ask your question. Kevin is... Yeah, I had oh, two. Sorry. I'll see if I can combine them. Um, I So you've mentioned the courses, right? I wonder if you've thought about, like, you said you wrote a book, but I wonder if you thought about like, doing podcasts or uh, videos or anything that's more, like, scalable and, like, what the difference is between that and, like, editing a course. And also, um, a quick question. You mentioned a lot of philosophers, but you said you're also a comedian. So I'm wondering, like, if there's any stand-up comedians that you're a fan of or, like, people you think are funny. Uh, yeah. Um, so when I was, when I started thinking about doing something else, and this was in December 2019, I started a podcast. And then afterwards, uh, the podcast was in Lebanese Arabic. So um, I, I, I thought, well, maybe uh, I, I will do that because it's necessary, because there were uprisings, etc. I started getting people to discuss what was happening and why it was happening, etc. But then uh, I, I stopped doing that. And I started doing something similar to what Peter is doing, marketplace lecture series. Uh, and it was also interesting as well. This was this one was in English uh, because I realized I, I had followers from across the globe. And I also stopped it because I needed to focus on, on the courses. So I have considered a podcast and I still am considering. Uh, and I have considered many other things, videos, TikToks, etc. But the thing is, it, it requires a lot of time uh, that I honestly now don't have uh and a lot of concentration it's like it's it's exhausting so i know what peter is going through so uh but um but yeah like if uh, if and it's still i still don't think what i'm doing is sustainable it's not scalable that's definitely but it's not sustainable and this is why i i am exploring new things etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah i don't know how things will end up uh, I am thinking about other things, but it, it does take a lot of time. Not a lot of planning and strategies, just sitting down and doing a video and editing and stuff. It's just, it's like, it, it really takes a lot of time and I don't have the resources to even pay others or get others to do stuff. Uh, yeah. And comedians, I'll just mention uh, the uh, three comedians I, I mentioned in, in my MD Sardonic uh, speaking. A sardonically speaking book and the first one is controversial joe rogan and the second one is uh, dave chappelle and the third one is uh, uh her uh nikki is it glazier uh yeah and many yeah, others like um i i just enjoy yeah nikki glazier yeah is, is this how it's pronounced because i never get it right. So these are just as examples of, of uh, comedians I like, but I, I don't like, I listen to, I, I look at absolutely any, like I, I any, there's another, uh, Bear Giglia is good, Mike, for me. He's an interesting storyteller as well. Uh, his, I, I like the way he narrates. So yeah. Yeah, Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> If you if you like if you like dark kind of um, humor, Anthony which sounds like was yes, I was gonna fucking say yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I like the guy as well. Uh, Eddie, uh, I haven't. Uh, no, I'll I'll check him out. Uh, J Anthony Jeselnik, yes. Mm -hmm. This guy is yeah, but very dark. It's like too dark. Uh, maybe, maybe this dark bit comes because in my case, like when, when you've gone through explosions and weird stuff happening, like the Beirut explosion, August 4, etc. It's like these things, you end up becoming a cynic 
with a dark humor. It's like, so you would laugh at weird stuff. Uh, yeah, that's that's how I can put it in my case. Like, because I did give a course on, on laughter, art, love, and laughter. Very cheesy sounding, but it sold way more than the analytic philosophy. That's, <laughs> you, I discussed Bergson and Nietzsche and Plato, but I called the course art, love, and laughter. And the, 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 you know, yeah, but anyway, so, so we discussed this laughter and dark comedy and dark humor. Uh, interesting. Uh, Eddie, I'll, I'll, I'll take note. Uh, yeah, and I'm curious, what do you think of, a, uh, maybe I'll sneak in the last question, um, something like the School of Life, Alain de Baton's uh, thing. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's like it's kind of gotten mainstream and there. I think he started more like esoteric with the titles, then it got really like, how to be a friend, like very kind of, uh, um, you know, sellable. Yeah. Um, um... And from a school of life is Alain de Botton, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I, interesting. I, I like. Uh, I do want to see. This is this is this is the kind of thing that he that I'm I'm talking about. Like it's it's interesting, relatable, watered down, maybe uh, cheesy titles. But if you really want to get people interested in philosophy, like as an entry point, you can't start with I don't know. The, Heidegger's being and time, you know, so just, I think what he does is, is interesting. That's all I can say. Uh, so the videos, the, the interaction, etc., is very interesting, but then it's free. It's available there. His books are, are very nice, but I'm doing kind of the same thing. So the only added differences or the only differences what you do also synchronously, this. So it's not a podcast, it's this, the interaction, the people, uh, the synchronicity of it, it's, it's all interesting. So yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I think what he does is, he, I think he does a good favor to philosophy. Many academics don't like him because he's not maybe rigorous, et cetera, but you have to start somewhere. <laughs> you have like, right, it's, it's not going to sell itself philosophy and, and the people are not going to automatically be interested in philosophy just because, because many other fields now, the difference is back then it was philosophy. Now you have psychology, you have economics, you have, and everyone is claiming to solve the answers. This is why many people read more psychology. I, I, I heard that somewhere, by the way, I, it was a video, I think. They're like, look at philosophy, at psychology people. They knew how to sell themselves. No, it's like, so yeah. All right. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll close here. Um, uh, yeah, just uh, before, let me just share the, the book because it's, again, it's, it's free, like, because uh, someone asked for, for it. Uh, the link. I think it's been shared a few times in the, the chat. Uh, uh, someone shared it already, yeah. Uh, the link uh, here it is, and we'll. we'll and sorry. Uh, the, oh yeah, uh, Kevin. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, thanks. And I'll put this on the uh, the video description so anyone can kind of check it out if they're watching the video. Um, so before we uh, make some closing announcements, any uh, parting words you'd like to leave us? Anything maybe insights or or something that came alive that you'd like to share? Uh, I'm just glad that uh, I found uh, Kendrick Spirit because I was not really aware uh, of what you're doing. Uh, so I'm, I'm just glad that you're doing this. And also your landing page and the Stoa, not the YouTube channel, etc., is, is also interesting. So I think we share a similar spirit there when it comes to philosophy and how you do things. Yeah. So like yeah, thank you for this. And absolutely thank you everyone for joining uh i'm i'm really thankful beautiful um yeah i'm a big supporter of uh what you're doing and this whole movement to marketplace philosophy so anything i can do just let me know um thank you and uh yeah i'll make some closing announcements in a moment but thank you so much for coming to the stoa today my friend uh definitely check out uh, Mahmoud's stuff which i'll include on the video description and uh, i guess i'll just plug you can check out the stoa.ca for upcoming events but one event i'll plug and so uh, you might not know this, but like we have basically no sessions on stoicism here at the STOA, uh, but we're actually having one um, 
like uh, probably 99% we don't have non, non stoic sessions, but so we're having two stoics coming in doing practicing the stoic contemplation, a contemplation of the sage exercise. So just kind of like, uh, uh, you know, contemplate the, the sage and I don't know, I don't know, we'll see what it's about, but that's on March 6 at 3pm Eastern time, you can RSV there or other events at stoic.ca. As that being said, Mahmoud, everyone, thank you so much for coming to Stoa today. Thank you very much. Have a good day, night, wherever you're